America Meditating Blog Talk Radio Show. We collect wisdom, hear stories, and inspire each other. I'm Sister Jenna. Tune in live from Monday through Friday at 8 a.m. Entire world wants. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. And humanity saw that the sky was not the limit. Achievement. Pass it on from the Foundation for a Better Life at values.com. I'm Ivy Hilton, and you are listening to America Meditating Radio Show. America Meditating. Radio show, tuning to love as we grow.
Welcome, everyone, to America Meditating Radio. I'm your host, Sister Jenna. We're broadcasting from the beautiful Meditation Museum in Tyson's Corner, Virginia. And that was Kristen Hoffman with love and gratitude as we approach the holiday season where we tend to do a lot of life review and relationship review. We kind of sort ourselves out and try to make bygones be bygones and um, move forward. It's always been such a huge language for us, isn't it? To keep moving forward where we're not using the same language, the same story, the same issues, situations, and circumstances are not a um, consistent dialogue in our consciousness, but more than anything else, it's something new that we have learned about ourselves. We have learned about our own divinity and power and strength and truth, and we're willing to go the whole way in applying that in our relationships in our lives. At least I think that's what we wish to do. We definitely wish to continue to amplify the qualities of the human spirit so that we can make our lives much more meaningful. Stay tuned. We are going to have Robert Weber on the line, and I hope I said that so well. And Dr. Weber, or Weber, I think it's Weber, Dr. Weber has been doing incredible work in the area of spirituality. And we want to talk to Dr. Weber about what he's been up to and learn more about his story. Before I get Dr. Weber on, why don't we do a little meditation and take ourselves to a deeper place, being ourselves and being true to our existence. Breathe in deeply from my Off the Grid into the Heart Meditation CD. Take some time and elevate your awareness. I invite you to become aware of the two types of consciousness that reside within the soul. Let us choose the consciousness of light over the darkness of past stories, the history that gets into our way. Let us now remember our connection to the Supreme Energy, the Supreme Soul, the Being of Light. For far too long, we have allowed the external forces to dictate our inner force. And at this time, I choose to get off the grid and step inside the heart to be myself. I choose to no longer be under the influence of what the world tells me, what my parents have told me, my spouse, friends, or anyone who has been a negative influence in my life. In this meditation, I stand strong in the original, eternal, imperishable worth of the soul. I, the being of light, the soul of power, I step into the heart and I become a being of love, a being of of light and goodness.
welcome back to American Meditating Radio. That was Open My Eyes from Lucinda Drayton. And hope you enjoyed that pause moment from the Off the Grid into the Heart Meditation CD. The American Meditating Radio Show is really pleased to welcome Dr. Robert Weber, uh, who has a private psychological practice in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and is an assistant professor of psychology part-time in the Department of Psychiatry at Harvard Medical School and a former Jesuit. He is the 2014 recipient of the American Society on Agents uh, FORSA Award, which stands for Forum on Religion, Spirituality, and Aging, recognizing his leadership locally and nationally in exploring the role of spirituality and religion in the aging services field so important today. Bob gives talks and leads workshops on spirituality, aging, and mental health all across the country. And together with his colleague, Dr. Marie Thibault, Bob established a website and blog to disseminate ideas about the integration of spirituality, aging, and mental health. He serves as editor-in-chief blogger of this website, which is based on the book he co-authored with Dr. Carol Orsborn, entitled The Spirituality of Age, and we welcome Dr. Weber to the air. I hope I got your name right, Dr. Weber. You did. Thank oh, you for the Oh, beautiful. Invitation. Welcome. Good morning. And Good morning thank to you. you. Thank you for giving credit to our process of moving into our antiquity and being wise as we grow into our maybe physical age, but also just emotional age in life, just the times uh, in our world that there is a call for us to perhaps become a little bit more introspective on our thought or ideas or feelings. I'd like to get right to our conversation, if you don't mind. I'm curious to find out, Dr. Weber, what are the dominant stereotypes of aging and how are boomers like tending to feel about growing older in these particular times? Well, let me start with the boomers part. I think boomers have, have historically been a group that stands up to authority, stands up to stereotype and says, not me. I think we boomers, and I'm a first year baby boomer born in 1946. I think what we've tried to do is live authentic lives and not just fall into line and fall into what the expectations were. I certainly have lived out others' expectations, but it was only by moving against them that I started to become myself. So I think boomers are historically and continue to be uh, among my peer group. When I talk with them, uh, we, we want something more. We want, we want to live life to the full, right up to the end. I think that's what mm. our hope is. Um, I love that. Yeah. That, that mm-hmm. is, uh, I think that's what we're trying to do. I think that's what, mm-hmm. all, you know, what we, Carol and I, are trying to encourage by telling our stories and having engaging people to ask important questions of themselves that may help them to move more in the direction where they fashion their own answer. And, I've been hearing and, a lot about that, Dr. Weber. Like a lot of individuals are talking about the importance of asking the right questions, which yes. I think my grandmother never even did that coming from an Indian background. You never raised questions. And right. here we are, baby, you know, boomers, so to speak, where we're going, I need to trigger something that's dormantly sitting inside of the soul. So what's the question that I need to ask right now? And would you find that others aren't really asking the question? Is it only just the boomers that are doing that? I think there are others who are doing it as well. You know, most of us sleepwalk through life. You know, we, we, we go through the motions and we can do that right up to the end as well. However, can we awake that's the important thing. I think awakening is a big part of our book. We encourage people to ask themselves, what is it about your aging that is waking you up? Is there mm-hmm. anything? And it may not be always, uh, you know, joy and happiness. It may be uh, moments of discouragement, even uh, heading toward dread and despair. But if those things are waking you up, then you can lean into them, like, uh, as, as I think in the Eastern tradition, lean into the tip of the sword. Mm-hmm. You may discover the opportunities that are powerfully inherent there. And I think as a boomer and as my fellow boomers, I think many of us really want to lean into the tip. Not that Mm. we're not scared at times, but I think the important thing is you can be scared. You can't help that, but don't be afraid. Give it a try. Okay, love that. Love that. And some of the other stereotypes of aging? 
Well, one is, of course, what uh, traditionally has been called disengagement theory. It's the elephant graveyard. You know, okay, get into your rocking chair, just rock about, and, uh, you know, you're done with life. Your roles are finished. You know, the kids are raised. Just pull back. Uh, the other counterpart, which is very prevalent, even among the boomer generation, is what we call activity theory or activity action. You get out there and you do everything you possibly can. You work out, you, you know, you, you climb Mount Everest or Mount Kilimanjaro. You do everything you can to prevent yourself from seeing the other things that are going on. If I only remain active, I won't have to pay attention to the fact that there's some diminishment going on. That, in fact, you know, there is some deterioration. I just spent the early morning with a PT working on a hip issue. So it's like, now I have to deal with that. Is it fun? No. But then Betty Davis said it well, you know, aging ain't for sissies. It needs, a certain, <laughs> it needs a certain courageous approach, and we need one another and others. We need to be encouraged by and encourage others, and that's what Carol and I are trying to do, to encourage you to seek the opportunities this, you know, pay attention to by asking your questions. What are the opportunities, even in the moments of light and darkness? Mm -hmm. And your your beginning of your show with the song about light and dark, or the meditation about light and dark, I, I felt so simpatico. I thought, yes, it mm -hmm. is about embracing both sides of it. It's not mm -hmm. about trying to get rid of one and hold on to the other clingingly, but right. to really embrace both, even when it doesn't feel so good. Well, thank you so much, you know, for the work that you and Carol are doing. And maybe we can move on to the book that you both authored together, The Spirituality of Age. Mm -hmm. And, of course, we're all seeking at some level or the other. But how did you get interested in this particular subject and actually began your collaboration with one another? We met originally in 2011 at the American Society on Aging meeting, and I had just given a talk with a colleague called, uh, the title of it was, Aging as a Natural Monastery a time for contemplating, a time to contemplate your aging. Carol had come to the talk. She found me afterwards. We met on the stairwell between the first and second floors, and we talked for an hour and a half and decided we needed to continue the conversation for our own sakes, first and foremost. We had the questions. We were grappling with issues, and we didn't find that the answers were always out there. So that, was the, that forged our relationship, the common interest, what we saw as the common task of our time in life. And we, we began talking by phone over the course of years, and we began to write at a distance. We didn't we don't live near each other. And out of that came the book. Wow, fantastic. Out of that came the book. Modern technology and the power of pure heart colliding, yes. right? <laughs> Collided. <laughs> right, there you go. Fusion and fission. <laughs> there you go. How beautiful. You know, world-renowned author Gail Shahi had described your book as the best book I've ever read on this most significant passage. Is it possible for passage through the older ages to be as meaningful a life stage as adolescence and midlife? Absolutely. I think each stage has its importance. Adolescence, you're working on two major issues, your identity and developing a capacity for intimacy. And if you, you know, stray from those and don't face them, you wind up confused about your role and you wind up isolated. When you get older, you're generative, right? You're giving back to society, you're producing children, you're, you're moving on. That's important too. You could also stagnate at that stage. When you get older, what's the task? I think it's a time to bring together all that went before, both the finished and unfinished work, the regrets that you have, the things that didn't go well, as well as the things that went well, and somehow to be able to hold those things with a certain equanimity, you know, that I can live with the fact that I was good at times, I was bad at times, and I was ugly at times. And if I can hold those all together, then I can get to what Erickson Eric Erickson, who wrote exquisitely and articulately about stages of development, ego integrity, integrating all of those elements, not having to exclude anything, including the messiness of my life. And I can do that as I get older. If I'm unwilling nice. to run away from it, I have to be willing to run toward it. Yes, it's true, because a lot of us now are using this flight mentality. We've oh. used it perhaps way too too long, and we're finding that we're uprooting ourselves every time we find a roadblock or a challenge or an obstacle. And instead of leaning to it, like as you said earlier on that tip, you know, and seeing what's the opportunity there for me to learn about my attainments or my abilities, then I'm not quite sure how we're going to age gracefully if there are a lot of unfinished agendas and issues sitting in the soul. 
Right, right. That's integrity. That's pulling it together. That's allowing it to come together. It's not sometimes it's not a pulling together. It's just letting it flow together. Mm-hmm. And and all of a sudden you go, "Holy, I don't th- this is me. This is really me." Some of the co- you know, some of the other meditation pieces in in the introduction to the show about becoming yourself. I right. mean, that is one of the goals of spirituality to to discover that you are a gem, that you are you are a special, you are beloved. And many mm-hmm. people, and I do a lot of therapy, many people cannot believe it. They, they, when they, I look at them and I say, but you are. And they say, you say that because I pay you. They have, by their openness to me, they, I, they have allowed me to see who they really are, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And right. I say, you are an amazing human being, a combination mm-hmm. of all those things. Isn't it amazing that at the core of every one of us on the planet is something so beautiful but there's also something else. That something else, we have allowed it to really take over our narrative. And as we're moving on, as we continue to move on, Dr. Weber, what do you think is the most important question that anyone concerned about aging should ask him or herself? That's that's a difficult one to summarize. I think all 25 questions that we have are important questions, but I think that to to look at at the, your own aging and to ask yourself, is there what's the wonderful song? Is that all there is by Peggy Lee? You know, <laughs> is that all there is? Because we can get to a point where we look at where we are in life and we look with at at our deteriorating bodies, you know, and we say, is this all there is? But to to ask ourselves, is there something more? And being able to lean into that question as well and to find mm-hmm. that there is something more. I have found some of my most powerful, growthful experiences have been when I've gone to places I really didn't want to go, you know, into despair, into dread, dealing with bodily issues at times and, and be, wanting to run away. What I've discovered, Sister Jenna, is that mm-hmm. by going there, I am more human myself, first of all, and I am closer to others. I can look at others. I can look at someone who's limping along on the street and not, as I did in my younger days, turn away and not want to look there because I was afraid I could be there. Now I say I am there. He or she and I are one. And Mm. that, I think, has grounded me in a deeper sense of compassion, which I wouldn't have gotten had the dark aspects not been there. So there's a gift that has come out of the struggle with the unwanted parts of aging. That's one gift. Yeah. I keep telling my mother, you know, I hope you don't age into a miserable old lady because I'm not <laughs> going to be able to have the patience. You I know, was... I'm just like, don't do that. What are the most... Well, the but most... then, Sister <laughs> Jeff, then, when she, if she does, and she may... I you know, know, and I've I know. I've seen it. I've given I gave a talk once at a nursing home, and this woman blurted out <laughs> as I was finishing my talk. She sat in her wheelchair, scowling at me the whole time, and she blurted out in a very loud voice. I won't shout it out as loudly as she did. Why did I live so long? Stop me in my tracks. And everyone else in the room, many of whom were hard of hearing, I'm sure they heard it because it was so loud. I said, "Could you repeat that, please?" And she yelled it again. And I stood there, hands perspiring, unsure what to say. And I paused and took a deep breath. And then I looked at her and I said, maybe there are two reasons why you've lived so long. One is that so you could meet me today and hear what I had to say and maybe Mm -hmm. find it of some use. I said, but more importantly, you maybe lived so long so that I could meet you today. Right. You know what would be scary, Dr. Weber, is if you told her that she was a soul and the soul is immortal and there's a strong possibility you might be coming back to just continue to enjoy this thing called life. Like if it was coming (laughs) from an Eastern perspective, I think she would have unfortunately keeled over. (laughs) She might have. She might have. But what I noticed, Mm. Sister Jenna, was that she, she looked at me and she didn't say anything, but the scowl left her face. Her body became less tense. She left the room. We had never, we never exchanged another word. And I, you know, she was quite old when I saw her, and that was a number of years ago. She's probably died. But I hope that she walked out of there feeling a little more that she was seen. Not only mm-hmm. seen in a way that says, oh, don't tell me about, you know, how much you're angry about where you are. But I could be with her even in her anger. Mm-hmm. And, and I that get was, that. That's the gift of this. That's the gift I of this. I get that. The, yeah. I get that. that Tell me, um, how have you changed after doing the book? I mean, has it shifted your interpretation of the way that you are growing into your beauty and wisdom? I think that I am a bit more peaceful. 
inside. Mm. Not not absolutely all that I, I would be a liar if I said that. Right. But I think there's a core sense of serenity now in me, and that that persists not in spite of the storms I experience around the aging processes, but in the midst of the storms I experience. So okay. yes, I'm scared at times, but I'm also not yeah. afraid. You know, mm-hmm. I, I'm less afraid than I used to be. I took this on uh, early. In, you know, my first I- introduction to gerontology was before my parents died. And I know that's why I studied, ger- you know, some aspects of gerontology, because I was unconsciously anticipating their deaths. I returned. Mm-hmm. I left I left it beside then, and then they both died, you know, one in 1984, one in 1992, my mother, my father and mother, respectively. And then it was about another, oh, nine years before I came back to being interested in gerontology, because now I was at the head of the line. Wow. You know, once wow. your parents die, you take the head of the line. So I was Got staring it. at the end, and I didn't want to be what Ernst Becker described as one of those who goes through denial of death. Mm-hmm. And I never had done, been able to do that because of my Catholic tradition, because I was exposed to death as an early, as a kid. Right. And But I didn't realize how uncomfortable I was with it until, you know, I had to start facing my own. And mm-hmm. I, so I turned to it, not in the way I had done earlier, which was, we call it in psychology, counterphobic. You know, when I'm afraid, I, le- I go against the fear. No, mm-hmm. I embrace the fear now. And I find that I am, again, more serene. Not always. Sure. Not always, but right. on balance, that's 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 the uh, that's the center now. That's the center. Could leave our listeners closing remark of what we should be doing with ourselves to age gracefully, and also leave us with a website that our listeners can follow you and get more information on your work. Okay, I, I think you're again some of the earlier songs and meditations within your program speak to that. Two things that I would encourage everyone to do, and this is right out of research that was conducted by a Harvard psychiatrist named George Valiant. He wrote a book called Aging Well. He had studied people for years and uh, graduates of Harvard University. And he discovered, he said, there are two things that help people age well. Yeah, you got to take care of your diet. you got to do all of those things to take care of your bodily health. He said, but the two things that he found helped people age well were developing deeper capacities for gratitude, and that was in your song earlier, and deeper capacity for forgiveness. And that was also implicit and somewhat explicit in what was said earlier in the program before I came on. So I would encourage people to work on your capacity for gratitude, And if you do that, you will also find it a bit easier to be forgiving, I think. Because how can you not be forgiving if you're grateful for life and the things you've got? Wow, I love that. I so love that. That was so powerful. Live Mm. it. That's what we need to live, Sister Jenna, that. If people want more information about the book, uh, you can go to the website of Inner Traditions, which is our publisher, you can also go to our own book website, Carol's and Mine. It's www.spiritualityofage.com. There are no spaces between any of the words. So it's www.spiritualityofage.com. And there's plenty Dr. on there about the book as well as excerpts. Beautiful. Dr. Weber, thank you so much for the work that you and Carol are doing. And if you're ever in the nation's capital, please come by and see us. I come down there because I have relatives in the area, near Tyson's Corner, actually. <laughs> so oh, I will try to do that. I oh, please do. do. So we can have you do a conversation or a workshop at the museum. Well, thank you. And thank you again, Sister Jennifer, for the invitation to uh, talk with you. You're welcome. All the very best. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. So look at how simple that response was, my friends. Compassion, gratitude, live your life from that place and not only it might be an age reducer but it just makes you feel better I mean, how long are we going to hold on to the pain and suffering and it's something I was asking someone this morning, like what is it in the soul that emerges these emotions and feelings, sometimes out of nowhere you wake up and you're just in that state no one has troubled you and so what are these things that are still sitting in the soul that we need to you know, begin to clear out and definitely like what Dr. Weber shared with us. Be grateful. Definitely forgive and forget and just move on, move forward. Life is way too valuable and powerful of a gift. And a little boy once said to me, the meaning of life is to live 
to your fullest capacity. And I thought, wow, that was so awesome. Hey, I hope you've enjoyed our conversation with Dr. Weber. Please take um, a visit to his website at spiritualityofage.com and do Google him, Dr. Robert L. Weber, and find out what he and Carol Orsborn has been up to with their book called Spirituality of Age. Remember, no one has the power to take away your happiness unless you give it up, which is a fact. And we are here to love each other the same, so let's start. I'm going to end it with our good friend Sanatan Kaur from her People of Love on her CD. Take care, everyone.